Hello, I'm happy that you are here with us. You are watching Medicine Today, live medical show lasting one hour. Today's topic is about breast, breast conditions, benign and malignant, breast diseases, breast imaging techniques like mammogram, ultrasound or MRI, commonly asked questions about breast conditions or breast health, and breast malignancy if we have time. For that, I have invited breast surgeon Dr. Lana Louis. Welcome, Dr. Louis. Thank you for being here. Dr. Louis is born or was born in California. She received her undergraduate degree at the University of California in Irvine. Then she went to Chicago Medical School, received her medical degree. For General Surgery Fellowship, she did that in the Medical College of Ohio. Then she did also Breast Surgical Oncology in Cleveland Clinic. She is board certified in general surgery. At present, she has an office in Tarzana, along with well-known surgeon, oncologic surgeon, Dr. David Sievers. Dr. Louis, first of all, as I said, that you are a breast surgeon. And I also know that the general surgeons do breast surgery too. So what's, what it takes to become a breast surgeon? Okay. So historically, general surgeons, so breast surgery is a very, very large portion of a general surgery practice. And therefore, historically, general surgeons were the breast surgeons. And then over time, maybe in the last, I would say, 14 or more years, um, the general surgeons narrowed their focus to become breast surgeons by maybe doing an extra year of training, such as the fellowship. And however, the, the leaders and the mentors of those programs are general surgeons. In practice, however, a breast surgeon differs from a general surgeon in that they only do breast surgery. A general surgeon will do, you know, abdominal surgery lots of different surgeries, including breast surgery. So the breast surgeon will focus 100% of their practice on breast surgery, um, breast problems, and workup and management. And so they have, in my mind, they may have a kind of more of a long-term relationship with their patient because of the breast problems. Okay. Now, now that you told us something about uh, what it takes to become a breast surgeon, we're going to discuss uh, uh, breast diseases conditions. Let's have the first picture uh, to show us the breast anatomy. Uh, first picture, please. Go ahead, Dr. Louis. Okay, so as you see, this is a mature breast. You see that the breast lays on top of the muscle over kind of what we call kind of like a shiny, filmy area. Um, so it's mobile, it's not, permit, it's not solidly attached to the chest wall. That's why they move when, like a woman's walking down the street. It's made up of lobules that will make milk when a woman is lactating after giving birth. And all that milk will then drain out through these ducts through the nipple in the center of the breast. That yep. nipple is in the middle of what we call the areola. And so, that's generally what they Okay. Now, how many uh, lobules or ducts we, uh, a woman has usually? So, that, so the lobules can vary in, in women between 16 and 22. Uh, most of the milk will drain out through the central nipple, but there can be, there's several smaller ducts in okay. that nipple. Next picture, okay. Next picture. This is another picture, Dr. Louis. Okay. At the so breast. Uh, the question I had, what makes a breast small or big? Come, uh, let's go back to the, come back to the studio. What okay. makes somebody, a woman will have a, a small breast, another one has a big breast? Anything? So, no, I mean, well, so in terms of size, size so yeah. a larger woman may have a larger breast. So it goes with size? Yes. Okay. It's, and of course, during a woman's lifetime, their breasts also will vary. You know, from after adolescent years, it will 
increase in anticipation for a woman to be uh, you know, childbearing, producing milk, and then after the woman is done childbearing, after they're done nursing, these glands which function to make the milk, they what we call atrophy. Just like if you have muscle, you don't use it, it's going to shrink, and then the breast will shrink just like the muscle shrinks if you don't use it. And so then when we get to be older, the, the breast functionality um, is, is pretty much not a milk producing organ in that way. That's why in an older woman, they won't have that firmness. They won't be full. They'll be mostly fatty because those glands are no longer needed at that age. Is breast considered endocrine organ, uh, meaning giving, uh, create, creating or producing hormone, or just milk? Is it's a gland, so it produces milk, but it's heavily influenced by our hormonal levels. I see. Okay. Now, uh, now most of the time that when a woman comes to my office for breast, it's the pain that brings them to the office. Let's have the next picture, please, and uh, let's discuss uh, this condition, which is not a disease. They think it's a disease. Some people, fibrocystic breast. Go ahead. So fibrocystic breast, they used to call it disease, but it's not really a disease that you would treat with, say, surgery or medicine unless that disease actually has a problem. Like, like so if you see on the left, there's a normal looking picture of the breast. The right, you see several cysts. So those cysts actually are part of what we call fibrocystic disease. And those cysts can swell during a woman's menstrual cycle and become more tender than say the week before or the week after. The, the cysts themselves can be seen on say ultrasound and mammogram, but unless they get very large, they're very symptomatic, most women don't notice it except for the cyclic breast pain. Yeah, usually they say, it hurts so much till I have my period. Once the period comes, the, f the breasts feel better. Uh, as you said, I still feel better that if we call this condition fibrocystic breast rather than disease. My time, long time ago, we used to say disease, but actually it's not a disease. No, it's just... Now, uh, tell us something about this fibro... Come back, let's come back to the studio, please. Uh, this fibrocystic condition I, is it common in a younger age group or older age group? What happens to this cyst as a woman gets older? So oftentimes the fibrocystic change will actually improve over time. So when a woman becomes, um, so when their hormones start to decline when they get older, their symptoms may improve. However, when they become pre or perimenopausal, they may have, they may have more sensitive breasts. Um, the sensitivity may or may not be related to cysts, but generally, cystic disease will improve as a woman gets older. Older. Uh, improve meaning because there will be more fat tissue there? Yeah, less, less glandular. They're, they're less hormonally active. I, um, I see. And less also, hormones. Yeah, so, you know, a, a physician may recommend decreasing your caffeine intake around that time where your breasts feel more tender. Maybe using some vitamin E or Prumer's oil to help with what we call the inflammatory nature so that the breasts aren't as tender. But it's a misconceived notion that breast pain is the first or the major sign of breast cancer. Which is not. It, it is generally not the case. Now, in regard to fibrocystic breast condition, is it usually a certain part of the breast, like outer quadrants versus other part of the breast? Well, it's generally where you have more glandular tissue. And the, mo the majority of your glandular tissue is in the upper outer quadrant. Uh, outer but yeah. some women may have more sensitivity in their nipples or around the areolas or right behind the nipple areola. It's okay. So that's a fibrocystic breast condition, a small cyst. Mm -hmm. Let's take the other next picture, please. Uh, this is a picture of a uh, breast cyst. Uh, Dr. Louis, mm -hmm. uh, explain the picture, then we come back to the studio and tell us about the cyst. Okay, so you see, again, a picture of a normal breast tissue, and then the, the multiple cysts in the breast. So those cysts, actually, if they're large enough, you can feel them on a physical exam, and they kind of feel like little, little rubbery um, water balloons. And so when you press on it, a woman may be tender. They often will complain, oh, you know, my nephew came up and gave me a big hug, and his head was on my breast and it really was tender. And that's very common with cysts. If a woman has a mammogram, you may be able to see these cysts on mammogram. If a woman 
has an ultrasound for what yeah, she feels. Yeah, we come to that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, let's come back to the studio, please. Now, a cyst like this size, maybe three, four centimeters, Dr. Louis, uh, it may cause pain. We know, you know what you do sometimes with these people. Do this cyst go away by itself, or if it was three centimeters, when I say three centimeters, are going to get bigger? So they can fluctuate with time. They can rupture on their own. If they're symptomatic, meaning that they cause a lot of pain and a woman feels it and it's alarming, then what their physician may do is they may put a very fine needle into the breast using some local anesthetic to numb up the skin after cleansing the skin. Put a very thin needle, extract the fluid, and that will relieve the pain that's caused by the pressure of the cyst. And a physician can see the color of the fluid, and if it's not bloody, if it doesn't look worrisome, then most likely it's fibrocystic change as it relates to cysts. Um, over time, cysts should get smaller. Now, is it true that uh, when you aspirate the fluid from the breast cyst, uh, usually if it's fluid, then it's benign, 99.5%. You don't need to take for tests, cytology. Most, yes, that is correct. So most cases, if it's bloody, then the physician will send it to the laboratory and they'll look for any abnormal cells. But if it's kind of like a greenish, you know, color, kind of like maybe, uh, should we say like iced tea? Yeah. Without blood or particulate matter, then it's, it most likely is just not cancer, what we call benign. Uh, what are the chances when you aspirate this fluid from the cyst that it will come back again? It can come back. Um, it's not unlikely to come, it's, it's not unlikely that it won't come back. Most often when you do aspirate a large cyst, there will be a residual amount of fluid in that cyst and if it's large enough, it can fill back up. Smaller cysts, not as, not as common, but in a woman who has cysts of a lat large, they more often are likely to have more cysts in the same breast or the other breast. So even if you aspirate one dominant cyst, she's most likely to have other cysts in the breast that are smaller or in the other and breast. And it's not worth it to go after those one centimeters no. or something like that. No, if they're small well, you and don't they don't need bother to. the woman, then... Okay. Uh, let's take the next picture. Okay, this is a mammogram of a breast mass, right? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Uh, uh, so, what's the next step when you see this? Okay, so this obviously is a mass in the breast, and it's something that needs what we call a workup to determine is this cancer, is this not cancer. So oftentimes what will happen if a woman has gone for a screening mammogram, just a mammogram, she has no complaints, and they see this picture, what she most often will be recommended to do is have a diagnostic mammogram. So she may come back to the same institution and they'll do more views, like with more compression or magnify the image. And then they also may do an ultrasound to determine, is this mass a cyst? Is it a, something not cancer like a fibroadenoma or does this look worrisome to be like a cancer? So an ultrasound, most likely would be done after something that yeah. shows up. Back to studio. I was thinking, back to studio. I was thinking if I see a mess like this, my, from my point of view, the next thing to do is ultrasound. I wouldn't do diagnostic. The thinking was that if it's fluid, then I'm not worried about it. Am I correct? Because sure. diagnostic will add more radiation, more expense. Because if you do ultrasound, it's fluid, you don't need to worry about it, in a sense, malignant-wise. In most cases, In yes. most cases, I mean, yes. this, is, this is a very clear-cut mass. Yes, okay. Yes. Now, let's, let's look at the picture of ultrasound uh, of a breast uh, cyst, if you don't mind. Next picture. Okay, so this is clearly something that looks like... So what you see here is, if, if you go from top to bottom, you'll see skin. Then you see this layer of fat. That's very common. And then you see that dark circular item in the center, and that's very, very commonly what we would call a cyst. You see this white enhancing underneath, but the shape is very smoothly marginated, and underneath you may see some muscle, but if the ultrasonographer, the technician who's doing the ultrasound, if they press down on that woman's breast with the what we call the ultrasound probe, and it kind of 
is tender, if that area flattens out and they can see that it's not a solid mass, which clearly this is not, then they may recommend it to observe it or put that needle in it and confirm this is just an abscess. Uh, next picture, please. So this is different from the previous picture in that it's not very, it's not as black, but it's oval. It has nice smooth margins. And this is more likely to be what's called a fiber adenoma, which is a non-cancerous type of mass in a woman, a younger woman's breast, that if it's small enough can be observed. If it's large, may warrant what's called a biopsy with a needle or removal surgically. Okay. Yep. Now, uh, back to the studio. Uh, now we got this new thing recently saying that when you read mammogram, you need to tell us the densities, how dense it is. So let's have next picture where there are different densities and then please tell us the significance of those. Okay, so you can see the pictures of the breast from the left to the right, down to the left corner to the right, and you see variable amounts of white area inside that cross section of the breast. So in an older woman's breast, the breast is going to have more fat than glandular tissue. In a younger woman's breast, it's more likely to be that bottom right corner. And the increasing density makes detection of breast cancer more difficult because the breast cancer can, it's what we would call, can hide in the normal breast tissue. So something that's more fatty is very low in density. Something heterogeneously dense is a mixture of fat and glandular tissue. Something very dense would be that right lower corner. And so now we are obligated to inform a patient, your breasts are very dense. And if a woman has very dense breast tissue and has a high risk of ham having family, has a family risk of having breast cancer that's higher, then a radiologist may recommend something else in addition to a yearly mammogram for this woman. That something else could be? An MRI. MRI or ultrasound? Ultrasound, um, and a whole breast ultrasound can be done, but MRIs can also be done, which are different because the MRI uses contrast. So it's more invasive, meaning that a woman may have to have an IV placed in her arm. Okay. And come back to the studio. Yeah, go ahead. And this MRI is something more commonly done for patients who have an established diagnosis of breast cancer. In terms of screening for breast cancer for women who have a high family risk of, have a high risk of having cancer based on family history or very dense breast tissue and other combination of factors increasing the risk for having breast cancer over her lifetime, an MRI can be done. However, it does have a higher false positive rate because it's very sensitive. So something may show up on your MRI. The radiologist may not be able to determine, is this cancer or is this not cancer? Maybe a fibroadenoma. Yeah, yeah we, we, will, we will have a segment during this lecture to discuss the mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. Then we can discuss more in detail. Now, uh, the most common thing other than fibrocystic breasts we see in our practice uh, breast tumors in a younger age group, women or girls, we call fibroadenoma. Uh, so let's have a few pictures. Uh, then after that, we can, uh, you can discuss that. Let's have the next picture, please. Okay, so fibroadenomas are a very common mass in a younger woman. Um, there can be conditions where a woman has very large fibroadenomas or multiple fibroadenomas. What is the origin of this fibroadenoma? It's, it's what we call mesenchymal, so it's not in the ducts, it's like not in breast the duct. cancer, okay. but it's called the mesenchymal. So you have that ectoderm, endoderm, mesenchymal. So it's really from the, what we call the mesenchymal origin of the breast tissue. Yeah, that's too much for me to understand. Okay, <laughs> <I'm sorry. laughs> okay let's, let's, take, <laughs> okay. let's take the next picture, please. Next picture. Okay, so this, this is, is the picture of the... So this uh, is a well-circumscribed yeah. lesion, and if they were to do an ultrasound, they'd be able to give us more information. This is clearly a fibroadenoma, or this doesn't look like your typical fibroadenoma. Okay, uh, next picture. 
So this is... Adultra self. Yes. After fibroadenoma. Yes. Okay. Let's come back to the studio. Okay. Let's discuss a few things about fibroadenoma. How common it is? Usually it occurs in what age group of girls or women? Whether it is unilateral, meaning one side, or bilateral, both sides. So if you can say a few words about the fibroadenoma. Sure. Go ahead. So it's most commonly seen in younger women, 20, 30 years old. Over time, these masses should decrease in size. However, a woman may have multiple fibroadenomas, and they may cause a lot of problems if they're large and if they're tender. But over time, they should decrease in size in the mid-20s to the 30s. How accurate it is to make a diagnosis of fibroadenoma by exam or by x-ray or by ultrasound? Is there a possibility that we may miss something? So in a young woman who has a mass, like in their 20s or 30s, mammogram wouldn't be the first choice to further characterize this mass. So it would be an ultrasound, and an ultrasound can give us a lot of information. And if there's any question, like maybe it doesn't fit the pattern of looking like a pure fiber adenoma, then the physician or the radiologist may recommend what's called a core needle biopsy to take a bit of tissue out of that mass, send it to the pathologist or the doctor who looks at tissue under the microscope, and confirm, yes, this is a fiber adenoma. In most cases, if it's very small, that mass can be elected to be observed. But if it's large and symptomatic, a young woman may have the may be recommended to just have it removed completely so we don't miss, say, cancer. Uh, in your experience, how much psychological effect that will have on a girl or a woman, knowing that there is a mass over there, most probably it's benign, but still doubts in her mind because when she goes out, her friends might say, well, Mrs. Science had something like this. Ten years later, and they found it was cancer or five years. You understand all these things. Uh, so what has been your experience in this issue? Would you suggest remove it or wait? And if you wait, when do you remove it? So if it clearly looks like a fiber adenoma and ultrasound, it's small, like, you know, one or less than two centimeters, it can be observed, but it's observed closely in terms of having an ultrasound every six months for maybe one and a half to two years to make sure that this mass doesn't increase in size or change in appearance on ultrasound. If it's at the size where it's already symptomatic and it's large, a woman may just want to have it re removed completely in terms of, number one, removing the mass that she can feel and causing her anxiety and also just get rid of, get, getting rid of the mass altogether so it doesn't have to be followed by ultrasound. Okay. Now, we're going to come to our next section, uh, or session will be uh, a screening mammogram, diagnostic mammogram, ultrasound, and MRI. Okay. Now, let's go with the screening mammogram. What is the recommended uh, time uh, for a woman to have a screening mammogram, and how often? Okay, so in the general population, a screening mammogram can be done once between the age of 35 and 40. Afterwards, it generally is recommended to be done yearly, 40 to whenever a woman can physically still be comfortable and have a mammogram once a year. And that age may be up into the 70s or, or later, depending on the health of the woman. Uh, what is your feeling if uh, there's no family history of a breast cancer, there is no previous history of uh, uh, breast disease to suggest the woman from age 40 to 50, let's have the mammogram every two years till 50, after that once a year. What do you think of that suggestion? The problem with that is, you know, there's some truth in that when you're in your 40s, your breasts are very dense. So it's going to be hard to detect a breast cancer because of your breast density at that age. However, there's what's called interval cancers, meaning that there will be a percentage of cancers that are going to develop between 40 and 42 or 42 and 44 that could have been picked up at age 41 or 43. So you you'll have to, you know, you have to have the comfort level of not having mammogram every year but knowing that there is a risk of what we call an interval cancer developing between these two I mammograms. See. Now 
radiation, we're talking about screening mammogram, uh, how many films they take from each breast? So for a screening mammogram, meaning that a woman goes to the center, no yes. complaints, no breast complaints whatsoever. It's two views on each breast, one top to bottom, which is a cranial caudal view, and then one is kind of a side to side, but it's oblique. That's why it's okay. from the kind of the shoulder down to the center. So two views of each breast. For a diagnostic, it's different. Yeah, I come to that. Oh. Now, uh, patients say, I don't want mammogram. I say, why? Well, I, I'm not scared of radiation, and uh, it may cause cancer to me. And so they deny to have, uh, they don't want to have mammogram screen, even the two views. So what do you say to these people? So in a woman who's 40 and older, two views of the breast each year is going to be less radiation than environmental, like, you know, if they were to take a, a trip in an airplane. And especially with digital mammogram, which is computerized, that level is low or even lower because that, the, the digital and computerized type of mammograms, that uh, it can be altered so it maximizes the view of the breast by computer technology. With less radiation. Yes. Now, what about the diagnostic mammogram? How many views and the radiation? Is it more radiation? What's so the situation? Same, so if it's digital, then it's the same amount of radiation, but it's just, it's more views in terms of how many, if they, if they do a diagnostic mammogram, they may need to do a few more views to look at s a small lesion yes. or something that's spread out. But it's, I mean, it's not a huge amount of radiation, except in a woman who has breasts that are developing, like a young woman, that radiation can, there are studies that indicate it may affect a woman's risk of having breast cancer because the breast is developing and then it's being exposed to radiation. But that's when a woman's in her like 20s. I see. Now, uh, not all places have digital mammogram, they have regular mammogram. Uh, what is your feeling where you would say, well, if it's regular mammogram from this age group, that age group is fine, but if it's this age group, you better have digital mammogram. What's your suggestion and why? So film mammography, the traditional type of mammograms, are perfectly reasonable in women who have fattier breasts, meaning the older population, because the, the tumors, if there's a cancer, are going to be easily seen on film mammography. For a younger woman, however, because her breasts are still very dense, given the higher amount of glandular tissue, digital mammography could be better at detecting breast cancers, but not all centers have digital mammography. So, you know, film mammography is still appropriate in any region from age 40 and on. And when um, we do, uh, or we ask for mammogram, and after that we, they say ultrasound, Patients think that, my God, ultrasound is better than mammogram. Why, should, why don't we have ultrasound rather than radiation? Please say a few words about that. Okay, so mammograms are still the standard um, way to image the breast. To detect gold standard. The breast. Yes, yes, the gold standard. So ultrasound is something to focus. So it's a different type of modality. You have mammogram, you have ultrasound, and then MRI for certain other patients. Yeah. But ultrasound is very focused. So if you see something on mammogram and the radiologist isn't sure what it is, but it looks like a mass or something abnormal, an ultrasound is focused to that particular area and then they can better characterize it. So you have two ways of looking at the breast, but the ultrasound definitely does not replace the mammogram because a mammogram is to look at the entire breast. Whole breast ultrasound isn't traditionally done. Even if a woman has a strong family history or has a strong predisposition for having breast cancer. It's still not a standard therapy or standard imaging modality to look for breast cancer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Louis. We will continue after a short break. We will continue the imaging method discussion, then questions, and then breast malignancies after this short break. Thank you very much. Dr. Sahag Arslanian was born in Beirut, Lebanon, and he has been in the United States since 1966. He received his college education at the University of Hawaii in Bachelor of Arts in Chemistry with high honors, magna cum laude. At the University of Hawaii, he was selected in the National Honor Society of Phi Beta Kappa.
Dr. Arslanian received his medical degree from the prestigious Northwestern University Medical School, which is located in Chicago. He specialized in obstetrics and gynecology at St. Joseph Mercy Hospital in affiliation with the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. His private office is located in Glendale. In the meantime, he teaches at UCLA as assistant clinical professor in obstetrics and gynecology. He sees his private patients in his Glendale office on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays only. Dr. Sahag Arslanyan is the host and the executive producer of the medical TV show Medicine Today. Hello again. Happy that you are with us again. And my guest is Dr. Lana Louis. We will continue our discussion about breast imaging. Now, Dr. Louis, MRI. When, when we call the mammogram place, uh, ask for MRI, it's $1,200 or $1,500 some places. Some places is $400. The one says fifteen hundred. My MRI is so many Tesla. The other, whatever it is. Now, I also know that there are some breast surgeons. The use of MRI is minimal compared to others. So, say a few words about MRI, the good and the bad things. Okay. So, MRI is a very useful tool in a woman who one has breast cancer or two who doesn't have breast cancer, but who has a very strong predisposition to developing breast cancer. So. Let's take the patient who has breast cancer. They've had mammogram and ultrasound, a breast biopsy. We know they have breast cancer. So the MRI is almost like a three-dimensional reconstruction of the breast because we can get what's called a volume of the size of the tumor. And this is not a simple test, unfortunately. A woman will be requested to schedule it. If she's still having a period or menstrual cycle, it has to be done a certain time of the month to decrease the risk of a false positive because the breasts are hormonally active. So when your hormones are high, because this is a physiological type test, the breast may light up and we don't want a false positive because if you have a false positive, the radiologist will most likely recommend a biopsy. And it's not the fine needle that they use. It's a very thick needle, almost like the size of the lead in a pencil, or even larger. So the breast MRI is conducted by a woman going to the center a certain time during the month. They have an IV placed in the arm, and a contrast called gadolinium is injected at a certain time during the test. It's a long test. It could be 40 minutes long. Now, this is not the kind of test where a woman lays back and they go through like a big tube, like a CT scanner. They're actually on their um, supine. So they're looking down, and it's a noisy test. Their breasts are not compressed, like in a mammogram. They're just free-floating, and they drop through a hole in the table, and a woman will go through a big round-type donut, and then they come out. And about a 1,000 images are produced, and these images are reconstructed and analyzed or evaluated by the radiologist to determine Oh, we see something here. Is that the cancer? Is it different? If this is a cancer, how big do they estimate the cancer to be? And almost like a three-dimensional uh, picture. And so they can very frequently determine what is a cyst, what is most likely a fibroadenoma, and what is the cancer in that woman's breast based on this MRI. So. It's a noisy test, and what the, uh, the center will do is give a woman headphones or music or earplugs to minimize the noise during this lengthy test. So that's in a woman who has breast cancer. Now, based on that result, a woman may or may not recommend it to have another breast biopsy, depending on what they see of this, from this MRI. Now, in a woman who has a predisposition or a higher risk of having breast cancer based on their family history or maybe a gene mutation, which is... Yes, BRCA. Bra yes. Yeah. Like, so it's, you know, it's been very much um, publicized based on movie stars having extensive breast surgery based on the presence of a BRCA1 or 2 gene. And in those cases, a patient may have mammogram and MRI once a year. They can alternate 
one, you know, at one month they have a mammogram. Month seven or six months later, they may have a different imaging test, such as the MRI, to screen for breast cancer. But it does have a higher false positive rate. So it's a double-edged sword. False positive means what? So my apologies. So it means that they may see something and the woman may have a biopsy and that tissue may be turn out to be just completely normal breast tissue and not cancer. Now, in your experience, uh, how often is false positive where a patient will undergo a procedure, expands, and then come up with the result saying it is benign, don't worry about it. In the meantime, she has spent 5000 or $4,000. Well, it, it's not tell always... Me something. <laughs> well, tell, me, no, tell me something okay. about that. It's so not that it can, cheap. No, it's not it's that not cheap. That cheap. Um, it's hopefully not $5,000 in, in most institutions. With the biopsy pathology. Okay, well, with the biopsy and pathology, pathology. yes. Um, it, so it could be high. It could be almost 30% or higher. Yeah. Um, so that's why it's very key to have it done during a certain time of a woman's month of her menstrual cycle, unless she's postmenopausal, and then the false positive rate is lower. I, I was uh, in the doctor's cafeteria one day. I was uh, with a well-known uh, breast surgeon, and um, he made a comment that in all these years, I've only done one MRI of the breast. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not, it's not what we call a standardized, it's not a standard method to be used for every patient who has breast okay. cancer. So if a woman is, say, 75 or 80, and they have very fatty breasts, you can see right through them. You can see that tumor. You can see nothing around it. And MRIs may not be recommended, but if a woman is like 45 and she has really dense breast tissue and she has a cancer, an MRI may be more, it may lend more information for okay. a younger woman. Now, let's have the next two pictures, please. This is mammogram and uh, MRI. Okay, so an MRI, okay, so the mammogram, you can see that you may be able to see some blood vessels. You may be able to see the glandular elements of the breast and fat or skin, depending on, you know, if it's digital. The one on the right. Okay, yes. Yeah, right? Yes. So the MRI is different in that you actually can see blood vessels feeding into a tumor. You can clearly define the edges of the breast, um, the nipple, the skin, and it's, it, it gives a different view of the breast because it gives so many more images that you can reconstruct. Okay, next picture please. Okay, so this is a picture of a tumor and you can see that it's... What makes it malignant? It's malignant tumor. So you can see that it's what we call spiculated. It's not, it not, doesn't have nice... It's not quiet, nice, margin. it's smooth. Yeah, it's, it's a good size because you can see it, but you can also see that it's extending. It has like little finger-like projections coming out, which is not a good sign. Yeah. Okay, uh, back to the studio. Uh, I think we have discussed enough uh, about the uh, mammograms and uh, MRI. The only thing that it's important, I think we forgot to say, that the benefits of digital is that you can take the digital and just send it to any place you want to even. Sure. You know, they can look at it, evaluate it too. It's very easily transferable. Yes. Right? Okay, now, here comes the section of questions. Questions that uh, every doctor's office, especially gynecologists or breast surgeons, uh, uh, women ask, and uh, so I'd like to have Dr. Louis to give her opinion about these conditions. Breast discharge. So breast discharge can be what we call pathological or worrisome for cancer or not pathological. So if a woman is squeezing her breast and trying to elicit fluid, that is not what we call spontaneous. It's not coming out on its own and therefore it's less likely to be something that's caused by cancer. Milky nipple discharge is very common, obviously, when a woman's lactating. There's another condition that can cause milky discharge from the breast, and that's called a prolactinoma. It's a tumor in the pituitary gland, and that would require some blood tests to determine if the prolactin level is elevated. That's a milky discharge. The most common worrisome type of discharge in a woman 
um, that may be considered a sign of cancer is bloody or sometimes clear, but it's spontaneous. It's not something that a woman is squeezing out of her breast, but she may see it every day as a wet spot on her t-shirt, her bra, her camisole, her pajamas. And it comes out very regularly, every day, and sometimes it can affect, this, this discharge may have other signs of being worrisome for cancer, like thickening of the skin of the nipple, which is an entirely different yeah, we'll, we'll discussion. Yeah. But dark nipple discharge that's bloody may not always be cancer. It's, it's about 7% that bloody nipple discharge alone represents a breast cancer. So more commonly, a bloody nipple discharge can be a tumor that's not cancer. It's called a papilloma. And it's kind of, if you look at it under a microscope, it looks like a little cauliflower. It has branches. It's kind of like a tree inside a duct. And the reason that there's bloody discharge is that papilloma can grow into this, the wall of the duct and cause blood coming out. And oftentimes when that's seen, you may be able to see something on an ultrasound. You may be able to reproduce that bloody discharge in the office and surgically that area is then removed to treat and make sure that the papilloma is not a cancer. But most papillomas represent just a papilloma okay. and not cancer. What if a lady comes, uh, doesn't have a spontaneous leakage, but she says, when I squeeze my nipples, I have blood or fluid coming. What, what's the significance now? So if she's now? squeezing her breast and most often it may be a greenish, bluish tinge. Whatever, yeah. It's, it's probably from a cyst. And the first so thing I would tell... So it's not significant. I would tell the patient, stop doing that. Don't touch your breasts. And then reevaluate them in the office to make sure it's not what we call spontaneous. A woman comes and says, uh, Doctor, my one breast is bigger than the other one. Why? It's not uncommon. Most, even, even runway models are not purely symmetric in their body parts. So breasts aren't expected to be perfectly symmetric either. The body develops in terms of the breast developing as one breast bud on the chest wall and then the other. So they, they don't develop at the same time. And so it's not entirely abnormal for, one woman, for a woman to have one breast that's slightly or even larger than the other. Okay. Uh, is there a limit to say, well, this is okay, but this is not okay. You need to have augmentation, any size-wise? If, if, if the size discrepancy, discrepancy is such that a woman really feels uncomfortable with her, you know, with her appearance, then it's not unreasonable for a plastic surgeon okay. to either augment one or, or, or reduce, reduce the, the other, especially if a woman has, say, back pain because one breast is so much larger than the other. What about extra nipples? Doctor, I have four nipples or six nipples. What's that? Most, so those are called extra numerary nipples. And when the breasts develop, they develop with what's called the milk line. So it goes kind of from the shoulder down, even to the abdomen. And generally, just one breast will develop. If you have a little nipple here or down here, it's generally just cosmetic. It's not a, it's not a big issue. You don't need to do anything or remove it if it's co cosmetic. Yeah. Yeah, if and it's cosmetic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, nipple inversion. Inversion? Uh, uh, oh. Inversion, inside. Inversion. Uh, unilateral or bilateral, the differences? So, if it, there's an acute change in the nipple where the nipple looks like it's being pulled inwards, yes. and you can see this is clearly something that wasn't there before, it needs to be evaluated because cancer especially if it's behind the nipple, can cause that nipple to invert by pulling it in by nature of the cancer growing and pulling, you know, the ligaments in. So that is not normal. Um, in cases where there are slight changes of the nipple, like one nipple's a little bit more flat one day or the other, a, a, a clinical breast exam is certainly warranted just to make sure that there's nothing that looks like a breast cancer. But if a woman comes and says, Doctor, my nipple was like this for the past 15 years, you don't need to worry about it. No, and a lot of women know. A lot of women will come and say, you know, this has always been like this. There's no okay. nipple discharge. I don't feel a mass. There's no skin changes. The mammograms are normal. You can do an ultrasound if you, if you feel something different or if there's discharge or something that's abnormal. But if everything's been stable for several years and no other abnormalities, then Generally, it's... A woman augments her breast, 
she falls in love, she gets married, is pregnant, can she breastfeed? Most cases, the implants are now placed under the muscle. So the breast gland sits on this shiny, it's, it's kind of like a slippery material called fascia, which is overlying the muscle, and most implants are now under the muscle. If you don't disrupt the glands and the ducts going to the nipple, breastfeeding is, it shouldn't be impeded. If it's put under the muscle. Under the muscle. Okay. But even when women have the implants placed under the gland, yes. over the muscle, unless there's a lot of scarring under the nipple areola region or in the breast tissue itself, most women have reported that they can breastfeed without difficulty. Uh, a lady unfortunately has a breast cancer. She has a mastectomy. Then she likes to put the implant right away. Pros and cons. So, if a woman has a small tumor, the mastectomy can be done with placement of a permanent implant under the muscle, preferably to make sure that if the cancer comes back, either, either under the skin or right over the muscle, then we can detect it. But a mastectomy does not completely decrease that risk of cancer coming back to zero percent. It's still a few percent. So in select cases, what's called a nipple and skin sparing or a skin sparing mastectomy where you preserve the majority of the skin and you leave a pocket so that you can put that, ex that permanent implant in, that's done, that's frequently done. The only problem is if the pathologist looks at that tissue that's been removed, they identify a cancer that's really close to one edge or the res residual tumor, it's going to be, that woman may require a second surgery. The alternative is what's called placing an expander. The mastectomy is done. As much skin as can safely be saved without compromising your removing the cancer of the breast can be done. And then what's called an expander. It could be it's often a silicone bag and it has a little valve that the plastic surgeon knows exactly where it is. It's placed under that skin and over time, every one or two weeks, the plastic surgeon will inject an, a, some saline to expand it and fill that pocket. And if a woman wants to be bigger, then they slowly expand it so the skin can stretch until the point where the woman is satisfied with the volume or the size of the breast and then the permanent implant is then placed. Uh, what is the, the uh, chances of missing recurrence of the malignancy by having these implants? So Early detection of recurrence, let's say. So in order to screen for recurrence, a woman still, any woman who still has, has had a history of breast cancer should have a clinical breast exam every three months for the first, say, two years. And then if after that, at least every six months for the next two to three years. Um, because, of the, because of the history of breast cancer, though, it's not unreasonable to keep following that patient every six months with a clinical breast exam for a very long time. And if something is felt and she has an implant, then the first thing would probably be an ultrasound and then maybe an MRI. To detect. Now, mm -hmm. uh, if a woman loses weight, we should lose her breast size. Yes, I mean, just like the rest of your body, if you lose a significant amount of weight, like 10 or 20 percent, your breasts will probably shrink a little bit. Listen, okay. we have been, at least I have been, not we have been, I have been seeing a lot of girls with nipple piercing. piercing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how much it hurts. What's the problem with that? <laughs> I ask them, does it I hurt? They right say, no, no doctor, it doesn't <laughs> hurt. I look at it, how could it be hurt? But well, okay, tell me something about the nipple piercing. Okay, so most oftentimes the nipple piercing is right through the base of the nipple above the areola region. And oftentimes the women actually will have their mammograms with those nipple piercings in. It's cosmetic. It's purely cosmetic. Some women say that it's, it actually improves their sensation of the breast for other reasons. But the big issue in my mind as a physician is the risk of infection. So if a woman has a risk of, if it's infected, you know, no matter how many topical antibiotics you apply, even oral antibiotics, if it's a foreign body and you have an infection, you should just remove it. That's all. And just clear the infection. Now, 
average, uh, this one, that breast cancer is the leading cause of death for women between ages 32 and 52. So when it's, when it's detected early, the survival rates are good, but because of the amount of breast cancer that we're seeing, it is very, it is, yes, it's, 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 a, the, it's a huge now, reason. You examine a woman, Dr. Uh, uh, Lana, and, uh, and you see a woman have a one centimeter mass breast, and suppose God told you it's a cancer. From your point of view, how long that has been there? The cancer started how many years ago? If you can see it and feel it, it's been there for several years. Several it years. Didn't, it didn't arise in the last month, year, two years. If it's something that it's one centimeter, you can feel it, you can see it on mammogram, it's already a stage one. I say to my patients, uh, it, at least five to eight years, depending yes. how like this. Now, uh, mammogram exam, how earlier the mammogram will detect breast cancer? That lady was one centimeter mass, let's say. If she had the mammogram three years ago, four years ago, may have detected something there where you don't feel nothing, an exam? Well, so... You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. Because a woman comes and says, Doctor, I feel my breast is excellent. I don't feel any mass. Doctor, science examined, there is no mass. I tell them you may have four years malignancy there. You may not feel it. You know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, so... Mammo I mean, mammograms are great at detecting masses, but they may have not detected when it was very, very small. It may have been there, but you may not been, have but been able it, to feel it. But is it earlier detection than our fingers? That's what I'm trying to say. It, yes, That's what I'm exactly, trying to say, yes, that you make can. to make a comment that mammogram can detect earlier than our fingers. Exactly, That's especially what with stage zero, okay. or what's called the ductal carcinoma in situ, which you can see on mammogram as little specks, almost like um, almost like talcum powder on black parchment paper. You can see stage zero on mammogram, oftentimes just as little white dots in a, in a pattern. We don't have much time. I won't be able to go with breast malignancy. I hope in the future we have time, Dr. Louis, uh, to discuss this. But a few words before we finish. What can somebody do to decrease the incidence of breast cancer? So a lot of it is environmental. So you know, exercising, have a healthy diet, decrease your, your exposure to carcinogens like smoking tobacco, um, not drinking too much, like not more than two drinks an evening. Um, exercising because it lowers your stress level. Eating healthy, you know, green leafy vegetables for the antioxidants and lowering your stress level. Stress is, yeah. Yeah, stress, stress is a big factor because we've noticed that it lowers your immune system and makes people maybe more prone to even other types of cancers besides breast. Okay. What's the role of the breast self exam? I'm sorry? Breast self exam. Breast self exam. Self -exam. The best time to do it is about a week after a woman's period ends and once a month, depending on, you know, if from age, even as early as 18, if you start using birth control pills, up until the age where you're able to physically do During shower exam. or would um, make I difference? I think the best way is when you lie on your back, your breast is spread out, you put your arm above your head and you examine from under your collarbone here to where your bra ends from your midline all the way out to the edge of your breast here. Okay, thank you, Dr. Louis. I really appreciate you, really excellent. Thank you to you, to audience, for watching the show. Good night.